paper balls are still up here. If I preach too long, you can just come up here and start throwing them at me, okay? That's what we'll do for today. Uh, if you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to be, as you uh, already know, in Jeremiah uh, this morning. As we continue to think about what it means uh, to think about faith and to think about politics in this season that we're in, and really in any season at all, but of course that becomes magnified at this time of year as we await uh, the presidential election in uh, just a little over a week. Every political candidate, uh, you know, has some sort of platform, right? They're telling us uh, what they're going to do, uh, or at least what they're promising that they're going to do, uh, what, what, they, what they stand for, what they stand against, what's important to them, and every candidate, of course, has a slogan too, right? It's not just the platform. You can go on the candidate's website, and you can look and you can see what they have to say about a myriad of different things and issues and all kinds of stuff, but then at the top of that web page, it's going to have one simple little slogan that sort of uh, wraps all of that up, short and succinct. Sometimes they're a little bit longer, sometimes they're really inspiring, uh, sometimes uh, they're really corny. Uh, in this p particular election, of course, in this particular election season, uh, it is Biden has bold ideas and Trump has make America great again. And of course, those slogans are just a front door into a whole house full of ideas. This morning, though, I want us to think about something else. In the midst of our continued sermon series on faith and politics, I want us to think about the platform of Jesus. What does the platform of Jesus look like? We have an idea about what our candidates' platforms look like, but what does the platform of Jesus look like? What does it sound like? Or to ask it another way, what might Jesus say to our culture? What might Jesus say to the church in America? Now, we have to be really careful here. Very careful, in fact. There are lots of people who are really ready to say uh, what Jesus would say to our culture and what Jesus would say to, our, uh, to his church in this culture in the midst of these polarized days. But there are lots of people, in fact, we see it on a daily basis, there are lots of people who very quickly, without thought, put words into the mouth Jesus. Things that he never said uh, that are not from the canon of scripture at all. Political pundits and TV news talking heads and yes preachers too. And people are quick to say what Jesus would tell us as a culture or what he wouldn't say. But I think we have to be very careful here that we could sort of end up uh, being like the guy that shows up to the reading of a will knowing that he is the only living relative of his incredibly wealthy great aunt Gertrude and he shows up to the reading of the will and great aunt Gertrude has left her millions to her beloved cat and to an obscure art museum. <laughs> we have to be careful. We have to be careful. And if we're not careful, if we play fast and if we play loose with the words of Jesus, we'll be disappointed and surprised when we realize that we tried to make Jesus in our image rather than making ourselves into the image of Jesus. We often say that Jesus came to fulfill and to fill full the promise of the Messiah and the Old Testament scriptures. And so we, as we ask ourselves the question this morning, what would, what would Jesus say to us? I don't want to say anything other than what scripture tells us. And the scripture that Jesus taught from and expounded upon, of course, is not what we open up in our New Testament, but the Old Testament, and that's where we'll be this morning. This morning, we're going to talk about three important Hebrew words. Three important Hebrew words I want to teach you this morning. Mishpat, and Sadaka and Hesed. Now, I have to be completely honest with you here. I, don't, I hate when I use that phrase, by the way. I'm honest with you all the time, okay? But... Hebrew was not one of my favorite things in seminary. In fact, I took as little of it as I could. But I remember very distinctly my Hebrew professor, Dr. Ellis, telling me that when the word starts with that, well, Romanized and then Anglicanized, hesed, that it is like hawking a loogie when you say that word. That's how you make that sound, but we won't do that this morning. We don't want to make anybody sick, okay? Mishpat, Sadaka, and hesed. Those are three important words for us this morning. Three very important words. We find them in multiple, multiple places in Scripture, but 
we looked at them this morning already, specifically in Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. Jeremiah has proclaimed that, that the day of the Lord, well, he's declared what the day of the Lord is going to be like. And he's talking about a day of, of judgment is what he's talking about. And, and he's telling them that you shouldn't be so excited about the day of the Lord after all, because that day is, well, it's not going to be a pretty day. It's not going to be a pretty day at all. We might paraphrase it and say, uh, as the Bible says, that there's going to be destruction and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And if you hear uh, that, uh, well, quite obviously, most people, myself included, we don't really like the sound of that, right? We don't like the sound of destruction and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so we ask the question, well, what in the world do I need to do so that I don't have to experience destruction and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? And God answers the question. I want us to read that one more time. And this is how this is how God answers that question. Do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. But let those who boast, boast in this, that they understand and know me that I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight says the Lord. Mishpat, Sadaka, Hesed, which means justice and righteousness and steadfast love and kindness. Justice, righteousness, steadfast love and kindness. I think if we really thought about the question, what might Jesus say to us? What might Jesus say to us as a culture we can't, any one of us, go beyond anything that the Scripture says. And I think that this is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. To be and to do justice, to be and to do righteousness, to steadfastly be loving and kind. Do these things, do these things, because as Jeremiah tells us, these things are actually who God is. We're not just asked to do these things because we're some sort of science or social science experiment for God or because God thinks that well it might be a good idea if you do these things we're called to do these things because these things describe the character of God they describe the character of God and these things are the things that delight the heart of God and that his people that we are called to and that we are supposed to be every single one of us in this place of worship this morning, every single person who is worshiping from, from home this morning on our live stream, every single one of us has a family of origin. You understand that what that means, right? That's the family that you started with. So it might be your mom and your dad and maybe a brother or a sister or multiple siblings. Maybe somebody else raised you. Maybe a, a grandparent raised you or maybe somebody else did. But every single one of us has some family of origin, the people who shaped us. So as I said, it might be your mother and father, it might be someone, someone else, but your family of origin shaped you and created things in you. Now as we get older, we all realize that our family of origin, as they shape us, they, as, they, as, they, as we have habits shaped in us through our family of origin, through the things that we saw and through the things that we experience as we grow up, that some of those things are great. Some of those things are good, and some of those things are, well, they're challenges, right? We work through those things. Some of them are great, and some of them are challenges. That's just part of the experience. Some of those things are opportunities for change. God wants us to learn from Him because He is our creator of origin. He wants us to learn from Him, to learn who He is, and to, to model that because of who He is, to be that. And not only to be that because that's who He is, but because He delights in this. These are the things that make God proud, justice and righteousness, and to be steadfastly loving and kind. Those three things. Jeremiah is going to expand on this a few chapters later in chapter 22. And if you have your Bible, you can fast forward to chapter 22, and I just want to read a few verses from there. Chapter 22, verses 1 through 9, and this is what, this is what the Bible tells us. Thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah, and speak there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, sitting on the throne of David, you and your servants, and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, Act with justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed, and do no wrong or violence to the alien, to the orphan, 
or to the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place. For if you, in, if you will indeed obey this word, then through the gates of this house shall enter kings who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their servants and their people. But if you will not heed these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. For thus says the Lord concerning the house of the king of Judah, You are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon, but I swear that I will make you a desert, an uninhabited city. I will prepare destroyers against you all with their weapons. They shall cut down your choicest cedars and cast them into the fire. And many nations will pass by this city, and all of them will say to one another, Why has the Lord dealt in this way with that great city? And they will answer, Because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord their God and worshipped other gods and served them. God gives a very clear command for His people. Do these things. Act with justice. Act with righteousness. Deliver those who are oppressed. Do nothing wrong to the alien, to the immigrant, to the refugee, to the orphan, to the widow. Do not shed innocent blood. God says, do these things. Do these things and things are going to go well for you. You'll see generations and generations of kings come to power don't do these things and things aren't going to go so well for you after all. Do these things. Act with justice. Act with righteousness. Be steadfastly kind and loving. Do these things. But if you don't or if you don't want to or if you don't feel like you need to, well, that's your choice. But be prepared for the consequences of that. As I said at the beginning of this sermon this morning, we have to be very careful through this kind of thing about saying, what would Jesus say? We hear people say often what Jesus would say, especially, I think, probably in evangelical church circles that are closely tied to partisan politics. And those, usually, when we turn on our TVs who are chosen to represent us as Christians on uh, cable news uh, shows and things like that. And usually we hear something like this. I know what we've got to do to fix it. It's going to be a lot of work, but we can do it. We're going to need a cross on every corner of town, on every government building, and we'll need to make sure that we get in God we trust on every single thing, far more than our currency, and we'll need to put chrome fish on the back of every single car and really giant ones on the back of government cars, and we'll need to infiltrate the schools to pray over the loudspeaker every day, and we need a museum of the Bible in every state, and we need all creation questions answered in a pamphlet for every grade school kid that they'll have to memorize, and all info that is published in the United States must be approved by a Christian board of directors. And then, and only then, when we do all these things, will we make God happy again, and that is what God wants us to do. Huh, well, maybe. But maybe not. (laughs) All of those things, if you notice, are about control. Every single one of those things is about control. What we control It's about power. It's about enforcement. But when we read Jeremiah 9 and we read Jeremiah 22 and we read other places of Scripture, well, we might notice that it's less and less and less about what we control and more and more and more about who we are and what we do. We don't see this much in politics or anywhere, for that matter, in our culture. And these things, these phrases, these slogans, these icons, even platforms, they don't really describe us. They don't tell others who we are. In a political world of labels and generalities and half-truths and these bold statements that just end up falling flat most of the time, the people of Jesus, His church, us, we, need to be people of substance. We need to be people of substance, people who will think deeply. Not people who hide behind, hide behind a bunch of idols and icons and, and bumper stickers and, and pithy sayings. As people of faith, we should be authentic people. People of steadfast love and kindness. People of righteousness. People of justice. That is what God delights in. As people of God, we ought to be more concerned with how this life is lived out in our own life this life is lived out in our own lives, what I do, than a lot of other things that we get so worked up about. Justice and righteousness and steadfast love and kindness. We think about these things 
We think about them in terms of our sermon series, Faith and Politics. We think about these things on a grand stage like uh, globally or nationally, issues of justice and issues of righteousness and issues of steadfast love and kindness on a world and on a national stage. It seems, well, it seems impossible, doesn't it? What can I do? I'm Nolan. I mean, that's just me. I, what can I do about globally or nationally or, any, or even, even locally sometimes? What can I do to affect global national kindness and peace? Personally, probably not much of anything. We go to the polls. Many of you probably have voted already. We can write letters. Sure, we can do that. But when it comes right down to it, I have no influence globally. I have no influence nationally. I have very little influence locally. But you know what? I do have personal influence. I have influence through the people that I can influence through the people that I have relationships with, through the people that I know, or through the people that I might encounter, I can strive toward living a just life and working toward fairness in my own community and my own spheres of influence. I can strive to live a right life. I can strive to create patterns and kindness of love in my life and in the life of my family, patterns of peace, we might say. So we think globally and nationally, we think, what in the world is ever going to happen there? I can't do anything globally or nationally, but I can do something personally. Something happened to me this week. Well, I could, let me rephrase that. Something happened to me, and I happened to something else, too. <laughs> That's the correct way to say that. I was driving to the church on, I think, Tuesday morning. And I was driving up 65 and getting on James River Freeway and... It was rainy, misty, cold that day. I couldn't see real good. I'm not known for washing my car very often, so the windows are pretty dirty. Uh, my wife would also tell you that I'm not known for using my blinkers very well either. Uh, it has to be a life or death situation for me to use my blinkers. I'm not suggesting anybody else do that. That's just, uh, it's, it's, it's an area of growth for me, okay? I was coming to, to the church. And I got on James River Freeway, and as you do that, you've got to move over or you're going to have to exit on Glenstone. And so I moved over one, uh, one lane, and there was a slow, uh, an 18-wheeler struggling to get up the hill. So I moved over again. I didn't mean to, but I totally cut off a guy in traffic right behind me. Did not mean to at all. Didn't use my blinker, by the way. I just moved over to the inside lane, cut somebody off. Realized what I had done pretty quickly, so as soon as I passed the 18-wheeler, I moved back into the middle lane. And here he came. He was mad. He pulled up beside It was cold. It was about 42 degrees that morning, maybe colder than that. He pulled up beside me, made sure that he rolled his window down, and he gave me a very emphatic one-finger salute. And then he moved on along his way. I didn't think much about it. Actually, let me rephrase that. I did not do the same thing back to him. But... I probably did egg him on a little bit. I gave him a thumbs up and I waved at him and then I exited. But I came to church, I worked, I did the things that I do during a normal day, didn't think anything else about it and I was heading home that day and there was a guy trying to push his car off the highway. And so I don't, I don't stop usually if somebody's just stopped over on the side of the road working on their car, but he needed to get his car off the road. I could tell he needed to get his car off the road. So I stopped and I helped him push his car off the road. And we pushed his car off the road and he looked back at my Jeep like that. And he said, hey, you're the guy that cut me off this morning. And I said, hey, you're the guy that flipped me off this morning. And he said, yeah, I'm sorry about that. And I said, yeah, I'm sorry about cutting you off too. And right there on the mean streets of South Springfield, peace was made. See, we can't do much globally or nationally. We just can't. We can, we can advocate. We can do things as part of a larger system. But personally, I can't do much globally or nationally. But I can do things locally. I can, I can, I can, I can influence people. And I can, I can live in front of people a life of righteousness and justice and loving kindness. Imagine with me for a moment that Jesus here is in the United States. For, one day, for a one-day physical bodily appearance. I know this is a ridiculous scenario, okay? But just stick with me for a second. Partly, because I, partly I think it's ridiculous because, well, if Jesus were to do that sort of thing, he probably wouldn't come here where we tend to think 
we're the center of the world, but he might go to serve wound, wounded and overwhelmed refugees somewhere, go to the incredibly impoverished people that are building their homes out of the trash that they find in the trash pits of, of India or worship with people who are extremely impoverished in, in, in Africa or in anywhere else. But work with me. Let's pretend Jesus is going to address the nation from the Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall. And it'll be a live feed on every single channel. What would he say? What would he say? Would he tell us who to vote for? Would he tell us what laws to pass? Would he tell us to do this or to do that? Or might he simply say, to everyone to whom much is given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. No magic potion. No crystal ball. No writing on the wall or pie in the sky. You have much. I expect much. As God's people, may we live and reflect those things that Jeremiah shares with us. Justice and righteousness and steadfast love and kindness. We have been blessed with so very much, and God expects much of us. Would you stand and bow your heads and close your eyes, and let's, let's pray together before we sing our song of response this morning. God, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful, God, that we got to start this morning with worship, and we got to, we got to experience somebody following you in baptism this morning. We thank you, God, for that. We thank you for what that reminds us of this morning. You are still active and working in the world. There's no doubt about that. Lord, as your people in this place help us to help us to reflect those words that Jeremiah is reflecting for you. Help us to be people of justice, to be people of righteousness, and to be people of steadfast love and kindness. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.